think of the great expanses of ocean, when we consider the infinitesimal part of this great area, which is occupied by a submarine, it is easy to realize why anti-submarine search is such a difficult problem. Great strides in answer to this problem have been made by aircraft with their ability to search vast ocean areas quickly. The modern airship is particularly well adapted as a submarine hunter because it is capable of carrying extensive and efficient anti-submarine devices. It has long endurance and is well equipped for extended operation in low visibility or at night. It is an excellent platform for airborne electronics and it is capable of delivering an effective attack on a completely submerged submarine. With an unobstructed view in all directions, and with its true all acting as lookout, the airship is a highly efficient instrument for visual observation. Oldest type of aircraft in point of history, the present non-rigid airship, or blimp, is the result of long research and development. In the great ocean of air that surrounds the globe, the airship can navigate in its unique way because it defies gravity. It is lighter than the air which it displaces. Aerostatics is a science that deals with the behavior of gases and that solid bodies immerse from them. The principle of lighter than air flight is best illustrated by the free balloon, the oldest and simplest aerostatic. The free balloon drifts with the wind and can be controlled only in up and down movement. The weight of the balloon is controlled by dropping ballast. Loss of ballast reduces the weight and the balloon rises. On the other hand, gas may be valved from the balloon. The valve gas reduces the lifting capacity, and the balloon comes down. More ballast is discharged to lessen the rate of descent. An airship is a free balloon of streamlined shape to which is an added a propelling mechanism, and dynamic control or steering apparatus. The rudders provide lateral control to overcome the wind and steer its electric force. The elevators force the airship up and down and are a decided improvement over dropping sand and valving gas. When deflated in the overhaul hangar, the envelope is limp and lightless. The envelope is made up of three layers of cotton or rayon cloth, vulcanized together with rubber. This makes an extremely tough bond. Helium is used to inflate the envelope. The airship has no internal supporting members and owes its shape and rigidity to the difference between the gas pressure inside the envelope and the atmospheric pressure outside. It is like a toy balloon which is limp and flexible, but assumes shape and becomes rigid when blown up. The control surfaces are attached to the envelope by means of finger patches and exterior wires. A heavy rope net pulls down the fully inflated envelope until the car with engines can be attached. 1,000 cubic feet of helium can lift about 62 and a half pounds. Let's look inside the airship envelope. The helium is contained in one large compartment. Air balladets are added for pressure concentration. As the airship ascends, the pressure of the outside air becomes less, and the relative pressure of the helium increases. These unequal pressures must be compensated for. That's where the air balladets come in. As the helium expands, Air from the balladets is released through air valves. In the descent, the reverse happens. As pressure of the outside air increases, the relative pressure of the helium decreases. To maintain constant pressure, air is pumped back into the balladets. If the proper pressure were not maintained inside the envelope, it would lose its shape, muscle, and thereby become unmanageable. It should be noted that the shape of the envelope is a dynamic airplane. With an angle of attack as it moves through the air, dynamic lift is produced just as on an airplane plane. 
Pressure height is the altitude to which an airship may ascend without having to release helium, with a consequent loss of lift. Airship ASW operating altitudes are usually below 1,500 feet to obtain maximum lift. The airship envelope that's punctured accidentally, or in combat, will still maintain buoyancy for a long period of time. The cell is so large that the gas escapes relatively slowly, even through a hole up to 8 to 10 inches in diameter, and the airship usually may return to base for repair. Even with the gas escaping through a large hole 8 to 10 feet long, the airship will deflate slowly enough to permit jetting. To counteract the loss of helium as it escapes, gasoline or water ballast can be dropped in an emergency, just as the sand is dropped from a free balloon when helium is bound. The present fleet type airship is known as the GP2K. It is 259 feet long, or about one half as long as the flight deck of a CVE. The breadth of the envelope is 65 feet. Its height from the landing wheel to the top of the upper fin is 81 feet, about the height of a CVE's mast above the flight deck. Roughly speaking, the helium in the envelope can lift about 15 tons. The envelope and control surfaces weigh 6 tons. The car and accessories about 5 tons. Thus, the lift of about 4 tons is available for crew, fuel, and special equipment. The weight of the car is supported by capillary curtains attached inside and to the top of the envelope. Supporting cables drop through the gas chamber to the car at the bottom of the envelope. The top of the car is designed to fit the bottom of the envelope. Fuel tanks are overhead inside the car. The engines are supported on upriggers and drive the ship at a normal cruising speed of 50 knots and a maximum speed of 67 knots. The controllable ship propeller greatly increases fuel economy, assists in hovering, and simplifies landing the airship. The average practical range of a ZP-2K airship at 50 knots airspeed is 30 hours or 1,500 miles. Although flights of 1,800 miles from Bermuda to the Azores have been accomplished with fuel remaining for many more hours of flight. Before the airship is undocked, the crew go aboard and take their station. The rigger checks all life jackets to see that they are in proper condition and in sufficient number. A mech checks engine control, oil and fuel gauge. The radio man is also the radar man and before taking off makes certain that all electronic gear is operating properly. The navigator prepares his chart to log for the mission. The rudder man tests his controls. The elevator man also checks his. The command pilot sits between the rudder man and the elevator man. Two men control the airship because of the physical force required to move the large control surfaces. Controls are also separated for precision maneuvering at low altitude. An autopilot is installed to take care of normal cruising conditions. With all the crew at their stations, the airship is ready for undocking. Batten is stiff in the nose of the envelope. This prevents collapse from the additional air pressure resulting from the ram effect of the airship's forward motion. The battens also support the battle wire, which connects the nose mooring gear to the envelope, thus distributing the stress loads when mooring out in high wind. A mobile mast is used to take the airship to the point of takeoff. When the nose mooring gear is securely locked in the cup atop the mast, it is ready for undocking. The mobile mast is an American invention that greatly facilitates the ground handling of airships. The tractor holds the mast, and with men, and sometimes mechanical mules, handling the tail lines to prevent the airship from hitting the board for hangar, it is undocked and brought into position for takeoff. 
The airship always takes off into the wind, just as does an airplane. Trim is extremely important, even on the ground. With the mast removed, this ship is extremely nose heavy. This condition is corrected by proper use of the valves and damper controls in the front of the water. Opening the after damper allows air to be pumped into the after ballonet. The forward valve releases air from the forward ballonet. This action of the ballonet allows the helium to flow forward. This additional lift in the nose corrects the trip to take off. Because the envelope acts as an airfoil, it is possible for airships up to 3,000 pounds, statically heavy, to take off in the same manner as an airplane. The additional lift is derived from the dynamic forces on the envelope. As the speed increases, the dynamic lift increases, so the airship is airborne. with its cruising speed of 50 knots, encounters headwinds of gale force, its ground speed is reduced, and its range is limited. High winds increase problems with ground handling due to the large sail area of the airship. This calls for a larger ground handling crew and experienced ground handling. To operate from remote bases, the expeditionary mass has been designed to be carried in a cargo flight and erected by four men in about four hours. By erecting this type of mass at selected airfields, it is possible to operate at high wind, safely, and efficiently. This flight of sturdy mass is designed to bore out an airship in winds up to 90 knots. With radar, a ram, Three radio receivers and three transmitters. Airships can take off, operate, and land in near zero visibility. The airship pilot has few worries about vertigo. The car, due to its weight, is relatively stable at all times on the bottom of the envelope. Because of the necessity for keeping accurate pressure, the airship pilot flies on instruments even in fair weather. Because he has only one control to occupy his attention, the rudder man can concentrate all his attention on his course in infinite weather. Guided by careful weather forecast and by judicious use of altitude, airship operations can usually be conducted so as to avoid most of the adverse situations. Like all aircraft, avoid thunderstorms and icing conditions and cloud layers. The technique of operating from an aircraft carrier has greatly increased the range of the airship. Carrier landings require a high degree of cooperation between the landing signal officer and the airship pilot. The rudder man must be particularly exacting in steering where the airship nearly covers the width of a TV flight deck. A yaw to starboard may cause the ship to hit the island. The landing signal officer takes the position at the center of the deck and by means of his paddle, gives landing signals to the pilot of the airship. An advance party of two men stand by on the extreme after edge of the flight deck, ready to seize the short line. The advance party runs forward with a short line for body. When the airship passes over the stern of the carrier, the landing signal officer hands his paddle to his stalker and becomes the ground handling officer, giving his signal to the planet by hand. As the car comes within reach, 
car party seizes the handrails to cushion the shock on the carrier's deck. As soon as the short line extension can be reached, the quick release hooks on the end of the ship line are set. The drag rope party steadies the tail of the airship. The ship line runs through fair leads on deck and then the catwalks from both sides of the carrier. The ship line party makes the fun. With all lines securely hooked up, the airship can take on a fresh crew, three arm, and three fuel for another mission. All in a matter of minutes. Breaking off from the carrier requires extreme coordination between the ground handling officer and the pilot for the airship. The ground handling officer signals the pilot to rev up the engine to clear the bomb. The car party is cleared and the drag rope is released. The airship is put into a nose-up attitude. The signal is given to full power and the short line extensions are let loose from the quick release hook. The airship takes off. Under adverse weather conditions, the airship may be fueled without having to land on a fixed deck. No, this is not the old Indian rope race. It is the refueling pole being hoisted aloft by an airship cruising along above the carrier. With the airship fueling and provisioning in flight, the carrier or any other replenishing vessel has a much greater freedom of maneuverability. It need not head into the wind and may even continue zigzagging. The versatility of the airship readily lends itself to the necessary coordination at all types of anti-submarine units. An airship can be utilized in both day and night operations. The mission of the airship is anti-submarine warfare. It is an integral part of the anti-submarine team composed of sub-surface ships, surface ships, and aircraft.